Hello and welcome to the Arsenal Ramble, where today we're going to be getting our teeth stuck into the upcoming Premier League away clash against Leicester. As always, I'm joined by my co-rambler, Dom. How are you, mate? You, you're good? Yeah, I'm pretty good, thank you, uh, Dave. It's Thursday evening that we're recording this, which means we're one step closer to the weekend and one step closer to that tantalising fixture away at Leicester City. Um, one that I'm really looking forward to as well. Uh, it's a team that we have kind of mixed results against, especially when we go away from home um, uh, at the King Power Stadium. Uh, I think in the last five times that we've played them there, we've lost three of them and only won two. Um, however, most notably, the last the last two fixtures that we've had against them are the games that we ended up winning. So that's the, the uh, more reflective results that you know, show our team today. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. How are you doing, mate? You all right? Yeah, yeah, all good, man. All good. Just looking forward to, yeah, to another game and another chance to keep that that run going. Well, I say run, we've won one game. <laughs> but I want to <laughs> I want to extend it into a run, if, if that makes sense. You know, try and get us firmly out of that rut that, um, that sort of February has thrown at us. So, yeah, really excited for this one. Um, it's a game that we won 4-2, didn't we, earlier in the season? I think it was the game where Saliba scored that that beautiful sort of that shot from the sort of edge of the corner of the box, wasn't it? Um, so hopefully he can replicate something like that in the uh, the away fixture. Um, but yeah, before we proper deep dive into it, so what what sort of team do you think Arsenal are going to throw out? Because there's been a little bit of debate over the, the Trossard on the on the left, and then there's. There's Tommy Asu that's played it right back in, in in a couple of games for us. Well, one in particular um, against City. Um, and then also we've got um, maybe Kivior, who's still yet to make his debut for Arsenal. Um, so what are your thoughts on, on the potential team sheet? Yes, it's a bit of a tricky one, really, isn't it? Because you don't want to change the team too much, especially after you've won the last game and you we were stuck in a bit of a rut for the games that preceded that. But the only thing that I would say is we looked uh, a lot sharper in that second half. I mean, I mean compared to the first half uh, the other day, we, we were woeful, really, weren't we, when we went two goals down. So if we could maybe mirror the second half team that we played um that would be good for me but i also understand if he wants to start with the same team and then make the similar kind of substitutions then i'm happy with that as well to be honest yeah because you could argue that when martinelli has come off the bench he's done really well and and you could say the same about trossard and yet when trossard started in the game against villa <laughs> didn't he was quite quiet, wasn't he? Uh, he didn't really get on the ball too much. And it was Martinelli that eventually made the difference. So it could just be a case of fresh legs in the second half is what we need. And both of them provide that 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 potential to provide that from the bench. Yeah. So it's obviously a good position to be in. Um, but yeah, uh, what, what about the Kivior situation? Because um, I don't know if you've seen the, the results of... Um, uh, the the club that we signed him from in Italy, uh, they their form has heavily dipped um, since since we've signed him. Uh, I think the the average goals conceded has almost doubled, um, which just goes to show what an important player he was for them. So you know we could have a real gem in our hands, and it, it, it's, it's sort of trying to find out when when is he going to. To get those first minutes but it's difficult for a centre back isn't it yeah it's it's really difficult for a centre back to be able to start in a game especially in the Premier League because you have this partnership of Gabriel and Saliba that's been fantastic this season you don't really want to risk disrupting that and especially you know against a team like Leicester they've got some really tricky forwards um so I don't know if it's the right game for him to be starting in um I, I would always say that the best time to integrate a player, if you're not going to do it in a cup game, it would be, you know, the last 20 or so minutes just to get them, you know, in the system of the game, get them used to playing a Premier League game. And then if they start to impress in those cameo appearances, then that's when I would then start them. Um, so that would 
be my take on it. And I think if both Gabriel and Saliba are fit, then there's no chance that Arteta is going to not play play either of them. In my opinion, I just don't think that's going to happen. You know, Arteta he has uh, when he has a group of players that he really likes. You know, the Jackers, the Zinchenkos, and most notably Gabriel and Saliba. If they're fit, they play, and that's pretty much it for me. Um, but yeah, I, I would love to yeah. see him get on the pitch, and it is really interesting to see how they've conceded. Mm. Uh, his ex team has conceded so many more goals when he's not been in there. But what one um, yeah. player that I would actually like to see, um, if not starting, at least get on the pitch would be Kieran Tierney. Um, just because mm. I feel like in the last game that we played Zinchenko and a few games beforehand as well. Zinchenko, he really has been making the wrong decisions quite often, um, quite frustratingly as well. It seems like he's trying to do too much. Um, I know mm. he scored that really, really important goal that uh, got us back into the game. Um, but before that, you know, everyone was calling for him to come off and get Tierney on. So, uh, and Tierney, he brings something different to the team. You know, if if we do end up starting Martinelli, he links it well with him. And I, I do think he would be a great option to have with Trossard as well, just because Trossard likes to cut in like Martinelli does. Mm. And he would be an extra outboard to stretch the play. So for me, I would pretty much keep the same team, uh, except I would swap Zinchenko yeah. and I'd bring on Tierney. Would you? Yeah, it was. It's a strange one, though, isn't it? Because he had such a poor first half, but then an amazing second half, and it, mm. it, it's hard to. You, you, you tend to like focus on the the bit you saw last. So obviously, the second half, so you think you know he had a great performance, but it's hard to forget that that, that you know the first half also was quite poor. But you know that that can happen at times. So, um, but again, it's a great position to be in. There's, there's two quality players there um, at left back. Um, both offer you such different things. And I wonder if maybe if our backs are against the wall a little bit and we are searching for a goal, I wonder if Tierney could come on for maybe, say, a Xhaka and we could um, pump, pump uh, Zinchenko a little bit further up the, the field where he, he basically plays anyway. Um, so Tierney could you know provide that overlap as well, which he was so notorious for when he was starting week in, week out for Arsenal. And let's be honest, was one of our main attacking threats at, at, at one point in time, wasn't he? So uh, mm. it's certainly something that we've got in our arsenal to use, um, that's for sure. Um, but yeah, we'll have to wait and see. What about um, Leicester? Um, what about their team sheet? Because I watched their previous game. I can't really remember who. I think it was against United, actually. Um, yeah. And we had Faze at the back. I don't know how to pronounce his name. <laughs> F-A-E-S. Uh, the David yeah. Louise lookalike. Um, yeah. <laughs> David Louis from Wish. Um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> he looks horrendous. Uh, really, really awful. Uh, do you think that's something? That, well, their whole back line is, is quite poor, especially with Johnny Evans and players like that out. Do you, do you think that's something that we could exploit? Yeah, yeah, definitely. In, in fact, as soon as you said, what about Leicester City's uh, starting lineup? The first player that I thought of was Faze, just because of how, or Fies or however it's pronounced. He, every single time I've watched a game with him in, um, he's just looked awful. He plays players on side instead of stepping up. Mm. Um, I think, Mo, you know, he scored those two own goals. Um in that game, I can't remember who they were playing against. I think it was Liverpool, oh, yeah. um, but he, yeah. he scored two own goals, which were both quite easily preventable. Um, and just his all round play, really, he does look like a weak link in that Leicester back line. So he's someone that mm. I would like to isolate, have Eddie and Ketio right on him and running him behind him. And you, you know that you're going to be played on side because he just doesn't step up. Um, I, I'm saying all this and he's going to have an absolute blinder and he's going to look like Maldini. Um, but, but yeah, I, I feel like Vardy, he's getting on a bit as well. Um, he's not quite got the pace that he used to have, which is, you know, I don't want to say it's a one trick pony, but that's one of his most uh, deadly attributes that he's got. Um, so I would feel comfortable with Saliba and Gabriel being able to deal with him. Um, and yeah, 
I, I, I think we're a much better team than this Leicester team. You know, they've they've really dropped off in recent years. Um, even the selling of um, Schmeichel, I thought he was an unbelievable keeper for them. Really, I mm. think he he yeah. kept them in so many games, and you know, they've dropped off in quality since he's left as well. So, yeah, yeah, I'm, mm. I'm feeling pretty confident. You know, looking at their team sheet compared to our team sheet for sure. Yeah, and that's a good point about the keeper actually because. I remember specifically at the start of the season, their their keeper is Danny Ward. Is is it Danny Ward? I think that's that's the keeper. Um, he he dropped some clangers, didn't he? Um, he was really really quite poor. Um, we've also got uh, a potential injury to Madison as well, and, and with, with him being their sort of talisman player, that could be a real boost to Arsenal. Um, because in the recent games we have played them, he's always been the player that that stepped up. Um, he, I think, he scored against us last time in that in that four two win. He mm. also nearly scored against us in in the previous game. If you can remember, that it was the absolute worldy save from Ramsdale from the free kick, wasn't it? That that um, yeah. that kept him out. So you know he's got the this this ability to 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 score amazing goals essentially out of nothing and that's certainly something they're going to be relying on so hopefully that that could be a bit of a boost for us yeah absolutely um and especially in the middle of the park as well um n- unsure as to whether Partey's back or not i think he didn't there's no, nothing to say mm. that he's trained this week so um he, yeah. he's probably out but Jorginho, he stepped up to the plate and he's delivered so far on um, exactly what we brought him into the team to do. And uh, I feel yeah. more than confident having him and Xhaka in the middle of the park to be able to deal with uh, players like Madison. So, yeah, I, I'm, I am mm. feeling confident. And um, fingers crossed, we can... Uh, I, I think we need a, a fast start against Leicester. I, don't, I think they... We shouldn't allow them to grow into the game because that's been our problem in recent weeks. Um, you know, against Everton, against Brentford, um, even against Aston Villa. You know, we we stepped off them, we let them play their kind of football, and unfortunately, we conceded. And then, you know, we've got a task on our hands. So we just really need to keep the ball rolling after the win, uh, stamp our authority on the game, get a goal. Pretty much straight away. If <laughs> I know I'm asking for a lot, but you know, that's yeah, that's need. exactly what was working well, well for us, wasn't it? When when we were going absolute hell for leather for the first 10, 15 minutes, really putting the fear of God into them. Um, mm. Sometimes nicking a goal. Well, every other game nicking a goal, you know, in the, in that first phase, um, and then sort of lowering the tempo slightly, but still maintaining control. Um, and that sort of template really was working well for us. And then, and also on the defensive side of things, that really heavy, aggressive press. And that isn't something we necessarily saw that was working that effective in the Villa game. In fact, for their second goal in particular, it was a, a real switch off moment, wasn't it? Where we forgot to do the the press almost uh, and they just bypassed our whole maybe four or five players in in a couple of easy passes so it's something mm. that we need to be a little bit more mindful of um but i think like you mentioned earlier Partey is a big part of that he is sort of that that anchor that anchor player that can him and odegaard specifically uh, really do run that press and i think with Jorginho being new he and he's not really it's probably one of his weaker aspects of his game is his pressing ability because he a little bit like Xhaka, he is a little bit slow on the turn and he's not the paciest of players. So that is something that maybe has um, weakened us in terms of pressing with Jorginho's arrival. Um, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see uh, if Partey plays. I've, I've, I've just got a feeling that if he has trained this week, it's obviously been kept very quiet. Um but this is sort of reminiscent of what Arteta has done in the past. He'll, he'll keep things like this quiet as a as a minor mm-hmm. tactical advantage. And, you know, who knows? He's, he might have trained all week and he might be fully fit. Um, <laughs> but I've got a feeling that with, with Jorginho's recent performances, um, don't think we'll be rushing him to back too quickly, if that makes sense. You know, especially with 
the the injuries that he's picked up previously of, of reoccurring injuries. Yeah, exactly. And if there's one thing that we've learned from having Thomas Partey and him collecting these injuries, it's that we shouldn't rush him back quickly because he just goes out for twice as long. So if there's any doubt yeah. about his injury, if about his fitness, then we should just be playing Jorginho because he, he's shown that he's stepped up and he he's more than competent to be able to do that role. Um, you know, we mm. have a little bit of a drop off in quality, but that's to be expected. You know, Partey is probably the best six in the league. So there's no chance that Jorginho is going to be as good as Partey, but he, he does just as well. But if Partey was to be fit, I would be interested to maybe see a, a Jorginho and Partey partnership in that midfield. Not Maybe not starting, mm. um, but second half, uh, you know, mm. well, obviously if Partey comes back from an injury, then he'll probably get substituted for Jorginho. But Going into the future, it's definitely an option. Um, do you, would you be starting Tommy Asu or Ben White in this game? Uh, I think Ben White. Um, I think he did, he did quite well at, at Villa, um, and he's now in that position where we need to maintain those minutes to keep that form and keep it rising and get back to that level that he was at. You know, he had a little slump. It wasn't disastrous by any means there was it it was just a little slump compared to his normal standards um and i think you saw it especially that little combination play with sake he just sort of seemed to get that little that synergy was back and that that, that and i think saka as well benefits massively um and he let's be honest is one of our most informed players our best player um and if we've got a fire in saka then there's a good chance he's you know He's going to score, and it you know he, he can make the difference. What about you? Yeah, I, I'm I'm really surprised that I haven't heard of any um, injuries to Saka as well, just because of how much he he took a battering against Villa. Um, I think he it looked like his Achilles was pretty much knackered during the game, but I've said it once and I've said it a hundred times. He seems like he's indestructible, and <laughs> I, I, I hope I don't jinx yeah. it. But you know it. it plays so many minutes for Arsenal um, and mm. it just shows you how important he was because when he looked like he needed to come off the other day Arteta kept him on just for the sheer factor that he had no one else to replace him it's not even the fact mm. there's no one to replace him he is irreplaceable in terms of our team and how we set up he is that integral to the way that we play so fingers crossed yeah. he is fighting fit and obviously he scored that amazing goal the other day so He's going to be, you know. In fact, he even he scored, um, he scored the penalty as well in the previous game, didn't he? So, um, Saka's form really—it's not dipped at all, really. I think he's probably been one of our better players in these recent games. So, he is such an important player to have on the pitch, and as you say, he links up really well with uh, Ben White. And um, it, I think, in an attacking sense, Ben White, he really does have the edge over Tom Yassi, doesn't he? His delivery into yeah. the box seems to be a lot, uh, you know, a lot more direct yeah. and he's a lot more clever with his play on the ball. You know, it seems that he does um, a couple of little back heels and flicks around the corner. Just that things that... Yeah. It doesn't seem like it's technically in Tom Yassi's locker. He's, he, Tom Yassi is good with both feet the short passes, he can play a long pass, but his delivery into the box, his corners, his crossing, some of his runs, they just don't quite tally up with uh, Ben White. So, mm. yeah, uh, especially when we're going to be, hopefully, going to be pressing and having a lot of the possession, I would much rather have yeah. uh, Ben White start the game. Yeah, I agree. And whilst we were on the subject of Saka as well a little bit there um, previously, um, today we, we, we've had... Um, reports from really reliable journalists saying that uh, a new contract is imminent for Saka and, and all signs are looking very, very promising. It's just sort of the the, the little details now uh, reported 10 million gross um, per year, which equates to around just under 200k a week, doesn't it? So that's sort mm. of not far from what Partey is on. Um, but with Saka, as we've just said, being our best player or one of our best players, um, 
what what a great deal this is for Arsenal. You know that that, that seems like an absolute bargain, especially when you consider players like Jaden Sancho are on three hundred and fifty mm-hmm. grand a week. Anthony at Man United two hundred and twenty grand a week. What a, what an absolute mm-hmm. like beautiful contract this would be. Yeah. Yeah, and the thing is that you have to remember as well is because Saka is an academy player, we've not actually paid a fee for him at all. So mm. when you when you break down the contract, it does look like a lot, £10 million for a year. But if you actually break that down, you could have Saka for 10 years. You could have him for a decade of Saka, which would be delightful. Um, and yeah. that would equate to the same value of what Chelsea played, uh, paid for Mudrick. And that's before they even start paying for his contract. That's, mm. uh, you know, start paying for his wages. So it, it just shows you how important it is to be able to develop these academy players, because if you're not paying fees for them, then you can spend more money on giving them these decent contracts, which makes them more likely uh, to stay mm-hmm. and to stay for a long time. And if they do come through the ranks, you know, a, a lot of them, they're Arsenal boys. You see Emil Smith-Rowe, he loves playing for the Arsenal, even though he's not played recently because he's been injured. But it, it's just great mm-hmm. to have this heart of young, hungry, arsenal orientated players. And uh, mm-hmm. especially if we can keep these guys for as long as we can. But we saw Martinelli, he signed a contract not long ago either. So I think we just need to get Saliba on board and then we've got a full house, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, like you say, Martinelli signed, Jesus signed for Arsenal, obviously, in the summer. So our whole front three are basically on fresh contracts. Uh, that that's basically our uh, you know, starting eleven attacking three mm. secured to Arsenal for the foreseeable future. Uh, like you say, it's just Saliba now really is the only one that's the really important one that we've got to get over the line. But I think at the start of the season, I was very dubious. I, I you know, I could just see him using this time to develop, get better, wind his contract down another year. And I, I just I just had this real weird feeling that he would go to PSG or somewhere like that, go back to France and, and just win title after title in that league. Um, obviously, this could still happen, but I've just got more of a feeling that mm. he I feel like he's at home now at Arsenal. Like you see that that yeah. chemistry he's got of our players. He's smiling. He's you know he's, he's joining in with everything. He's, he just seems at home now in an Arsenal shirt. So yeah, fingers crossed we can we can get him as the, as the third youngster signed up to a, to a long term contract. Oh yeah, absolutely. And whenever you watch Saliba play. He does look like such a calm, collected player. Like he's just so cool and confident. But when you when you saw his score the other day against Villa, when we scored that brace, he went absolutely berserk. He was fist pumping, jumping into the fans. You know, ale ale, like going absolutely <laughs> mental. And you love to see that spirit. It just shows you that he does actually care about the team. You know, he's he's not in it just to get another year of development, get a Premier League uh, campaign on his CV and then just bugger off to France or do something like that. It it, it just shows you that he really is committed to uh, playing for Arsenal. And, you know, a lot of French players do like playing for Arsenal. It's it's historically been a French orientated team. So, yeah, I, I, I feel more confident, especially if we do end up winning the Premier League, then, you know, why would he... Why would he not want to sign a a new contract? But it it does fill me with a lot of confidence that we're going to have all of these star players, well, guaranteed to be playing in the Champions League next season. Um, Well, that's if we get Champions League, but they're going to be with us next season and it looks likely that we get the Champions League. So to to have names like Saka, Martinelli, Gabriel Jesus, Partey, Jorginho, Odegaard. We've got all these players and they will be playing for us in Europe next season. And it's, I can't wait. I cannot wait. Yeah. And and these are the sort of players that you're like the spine of Arsenal, aren't they? And now we can, now we've got Champions League football, hopefully. Um, that <laughs> now gives us the ability to attract that next level player. You know, your Declan Rice or, or whoever it may be. Um, and really, really p- push on and grow as a club. And, and maybe where other teams that have been in this position before, like a Liverpool, have failed in the in the transfer market and now are ultimately paying the prices for that. You mean, I mean, you look at their midfield and it is 
it is aging um and they signed you know Thiago another aging player and they've just they've just not recruited well in that midfield and it and it's now really hurting them in even at, in central defense van dijk looks no way near the sort of level he used to be at so you know it's a, it's it's proof that if you don't recruit wise even when you're at the top of your game Mm. it can affect you for years to come so i think that's one thing that i really have now got my full trust in arsenal over like if, if we get linked to a player and it's someone that arteta wants i don't really even think about it too much i just <laughs> go okay if arteta wants him then 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 great he, he must yeah he must be good <laughs> <laughs> if arteta and eddie want them then so be it I, I i will completely put my trust in them and yeah it's interesting that you say that about liverpool because it does seem like after being so dominant in Europe and being so dominant in the Premier League over the last few seasons, it looks like they've come to the end of their evolution. You know, their their star players are aging players. They're not performing to the standards that they were before. They got rid of Mane and didn't really replace him. I, I know they got Luis Diaz, but he he's been injured and um, yeah. the, and as you say, the midfield, which was their um, high pressing full of energy team, uh, full of energy midfield, they're all old, so they can't do it now. And they've had to chuck in a few kids who, to be fair to Liverpool, they do look quite promising. Um, you know, mm. is it ba Bayer, Titch or Badger? I can't pronounce his name, but he looks pretty good. Yeah. Um, but the, the, these are the sort of signings that they needed to make maybe two seasons ago to, um, you know, fully integrate them into the team so that when these older mm. players start leaving and retiring uh, and start winding down, then they can just come straight into the fold. And I think that's the sort of model that Arsenal are doing now. We've got our main spine of our team and then we're, we're bringing in players like Kiwio so that, you know, for example, if um, Gabriel was injured, we can chuck him in and hopefully he can do a job and he's a few years younger. So it gives us that, mm. gives us that extra safety net, that security that there's players coming through all the time. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think our midfield is starting to get a bit aging as well with Partey um, knocking on the door of 30 and Xhaka, I think he's 30, maybe 31, isn't he? So, um, mm. you know, we're getting to that time where injuries may occur more often. And to be honest, we're seeing that with Partey, aren't we? His injury record at Atletico Madrid was impeccable um, since he's come to Arsenal um, from mm. the age of 27. He's just can not maintain fitness. Um, and this is something that we can't really risk too much. We, you know, having Laconga as our backup for the last year and a half hasn't worked. It's really yeah. affected us uh, in games. And I think bringing in a Declan Rice is, is something that is going to massively, massively improve our depth. And yeah. um, because, you know, to have both of those in our team. Um, even rise to learn off party, you know that, mm. that that's um, a tantalising prospect. I, I, and to be honest, I think I think Declan Rice is is a, a, such an underrated player. I think he gets sort of tarnished with that. Oh, he's English, so he's not. You know, he, he can't be good because he's not Brazilian. Sort of stigma. <laughs> um, but if you watch him play, I mean, I think you messaged me the other day uh, in that game he was playing against, um, who was it against? Was it Tottenham? I, was, I can't remember. Um, yeah, West Ham Tottenham. But yeah, he just looked amazing, didn't he? He just dictated play. He was even, he was pinging passes horizontally. Oh, yeah, he just, he's someone that would just slot into our team like a glove, you know? Mm. Yeah, he does look a level above the rest um, in that midfield for West Ham. I think, is it um, Suchek who partners him yeah. in that team? Um, he really has dropped off a cliff in form, hasn't he, compared to how dominant he was last season. And I think the reason why um, there's a few naysayers on the whole Rice thing is partly because of that. I think, you know, he's having to overcompensate for Suchek's um, current form because of how bad, it, bad he's yeah. been. Um, but yeah, every time Rice gets on the ball, he looks like a Rolls Royce, doesn't he? He, he just kind of mm. glides past players, but he, he's not that quick. It's really strange to watch. I, I don't really know how mm. he does it. It's, it's almost like um, Jude Bellingham does a similar thing where they just kind of stride 
You know, they, they get the ball, yeah. stride past players, and they make the, uh, decent passes. They're always in the best position. Uh, they intercept the ball well. So, yeah, he would be great to have. And it would be good for him to learn off both Partey and Jorginho, just because Jorginho's mm-hmm. had so much wealth of experience. He's been, you know, Champions League finals. Um, he's won Premier Leagues as well. And it's also worth noting, I saw a stat actually, um, that Jorginho has, uh, in the Aston Villa game, Jorginho made the most forward progressive passes um, from that position, um, more than Thomas Partey has all season with 15. So, oh. you know, it just mm. shows you how shows you. people said that Jorginho might be able to do a job going left and right you know, playing the sideways ball. But it just shows you that he made more progressive passes than Partey has all season in one game. Mm. So he's got that to his, uh, yeah. he's got that in his game as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. While we're on the subject of like of transfers, I know we've digressed a little bit from, um, <laughs> from the Leicester game. <laughs> but um, do you think we've dodged a bullet with uh, Mudrick? Because I- I've seen, I've seen these games in that first game that he came off, um, started actually, he looked, no, he came off the bench. He looked really, really quite good. And I was thinking, oh, this, yeah, we have missed out on something, you know, here. Ever since then, I think there's maybe been six or seven more games and he's now sort of been relegated to the bench uh, and he barely even touches the ball in games, which, you know, you could argue it's, well, that's not his fault, um, but you could also argue it is his fault. Um he just doesn't look like the player that we saw at Shakhtar. Mm. Do you think? Also, he's apparently his coach uh, from Shakhtar Donetsk has, has confirmed that uh, he's not very happy at Chelsea, and his, his mood is is pretty low. And you know, these these are all rumors, and it's it's transfer, not transfer. It's just gossip at the end of the day, but. Do you think we've dodged a bullet with, with Mudrick? Well, I, I hope he's um, prepared to be unhappy for the next eight and a half years because that's what he signed <laughs> up for. Um, but yeah, it's a completely different league, isn't it? You know, you're going to be if you if you're that good in the uh, in the Ukrainian league, then it's it doesn't mean that you're going to replicate that when he comes to the Premier League because there's a reason why it's the best league in the world. Um, but, mm. yeah, it's too early to make a defini- definitive uh, kind of answer on Madrid just yet. I-, I do think that there will be... He will show glimpses of um, his quality. I-, I do think he'll get a few goals. I think he'll play quite well. But I, I think he he's fit perfectly into the Chelsea model of... Um, you know, a player that um, it's cost too much money and then he's then relegated to the bench. Um, so he's a perfect Chelsea player. <laughs> but the thing is, I it just seems like such a strange transfer to for him personally to make in the first place. I know the reason why he ended up going there is because Chelsea offered so much money to Shakhtar and they said, you can go to Chelsea sort of thing. And then he, he was just desperate mm. to come to the Premier League at that point. But... Yeah, it, it it seems like such a crazy transfer for him to make with the amount of forward players that they've got, especially young forward players as well. They've got he's got so much competition there, and to go from mm. playing every week and being the best player on the team to you know starting on the bench, it. I mean, I don't really care about him anymore because he's not an Arsenal player. So, yeah, I yeah, hope he, that's <laughs> hope it. he rots. <laughs> <laughs> that's it in it. Yeah, I, I don't want to talk about opposition players too much but I don't know I just I, I do feel a bit salty how it happened because we did have our hearts set on him didn't we and and to be honest I do think he would be playing a, a lot better in this Arsenal team you know that, that Chelsea mm. team is mid-table for a reason isn't it at the end of the day so he isn't going to have the same sort of journey as he would have had at Arsenal and, and that's probably the the mistake he's probably made um so um We've got well, so City have got Bournemouth this uh, this weekend, haven't they? And they play yeah. in the five thirty fixture, so we play before them. So we've got another opportunity to put a little bit of pressure onto them. And we haven't actually talked about what happened last weekend because straight after the uh, 
Villa game, we jumped on and did the post-match podcast before the the full-time result in the City game. So, you know, they've, they've dropped points. We, you know, it was absolute pandemonium, wasn't it, when we lost the game against City? It was like, oh, we've thrown the title away, blah, blah, blah. Um, one match week later, and we've essentially recouped those points back already, there or thereabouts. <laughs> um, yeah. And all, all things are, you know, sunshine and roses again. But um, <laughs> is this another opportunity to to put the pressure on them? I know they're playing Bournemouth, which is probably one of the worst teams in the league. Um, but they are away. Uh, do, do you think we could put the pressure on them and, and maybe, maybe, you know, make that gap a little bit bigger? Well, it just shows you how quickly things can change in football because we went from we're winning the league, we're eight points clear, to we've thrown it away because we lost to Man City. So then, obviously, as you say, a week later, we've pretty much recouped the gap. Um, but, yeah, I think what we need to do is we need to just focus on ourselves, um, first and foremost, get the three points in the bag, and we need to assume that Man City are going to win every game. If we assume that they win every game, um, then if they drop points to these teams, because you don't, you didn't think they were going to drop points to Forest, and they did. And to be honest, they shouldn't have dropped points to Forest with the amount of chances that they had. Um, I think Erling Haaland did everything he, he could to not score. Um, so, yeah, uh, it's important that we just focus on because it's in our hands. People forget that. You know, we're not chasing City at all. We've got a game in hand. We've got we're two points clear. If, for example, if we do win this game and then we assume that Man City would beat Bournemouth um, and then we go to Everton on Wednesday and if we were to win that game, which at, at home you would think is a pretty winnable game, we're talking, we're, we're five points clear again on the, uh, the same amount of games played. So it just shows you that if we don't focus too much about other results, uh, yeah, it would yeah. be nice for for them to drop points. Um, but yeah, we, we, can't, we can't be... Put, crossing our fingers too much hoping that Man City are going to drop points to teams like Bournemouth really can we no 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 you, you're spot on we've just got to focus on ourselves um, take each game as it comes and, and just get as many points as we can on the board and, and then then hopefully that puts us in a good position come April May time and, and, and then we can start sort of thinking oh if we're in this and they lose that and then you know <laughs> you know, th- then it's more like you know you can calculate it out yeah. but when we're when we're still in February, it's difficult to do that, isn't it? But yeah, fingers crossed exactly. anyway for Bournemouth. <laughs> exactly. Once um, it comes down so, to crunch time. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, score predictions then. Um, I want to get your thoughts first. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> yeah. So, whenever we play Leicester, it does always seem to be quite a high scoring game. I think it's just because both teams play quite expansively don't they they don't really sit back they're not known for being a a um negative team Leicester they do really come to play don't they we saw that actually when they went to Man United the other week which they ended up losing three mm-hmm. nil however in the first half Leicester could have been three or four up um if it wasn't for David De Gea so we do need to be mindful of that because Leicester are going to come out of the blocks so I I think Leicester will score but I think we will score more. So for that reason, I'm going to give it a 3-1 to the Arsenal. 3-1. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're right, though. That, that there is always goals, isn't there, in this game? There's always a lot mm. of goals. Um, but for some reason, I just think with the positivity of last weekend and, and that last-minute winner, well, you know, and we've got another goal, but still, it was a last-minute sort of game. <laughs> Uh, that we won and with the City fixture as well it just sort of gave everyone that extra little boost I've just got a feeling that the confidence levels are are getting back to where they were and I'm hoping we can get a clean sheet because it's something that we could really could do with um, It's we've not managed to do it in a while have we um, I'm going to go for a, a 3-0 you know I'm going to go for a 3-0 Ooh. and I think Eddie's going to get on the score sheet um, oh, I think it's about time that that he that he bags again, and and Saka as well. Naturally, I think he, his form is is absolutely brilliant at the minute, and 
it's maybe got him a couple of goals in in him as well. So I'm going to go for a three yeah. 0 I think. Yeah, I think it is so important that Eddie would get on the score sheet as well because you know he's taken a battering in recent weeks with uh, mm. in terms of his performances and people saying that he's just not good enough for the team. Uh, people are forgetting that in the five, six, seven games that we had before those games, he was fantastic and he was scoring left, right, and centre. Yeah. So. You know, it would be it would be so good for Eddie to get on the score sheet, and um, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm really looking forward to this one. And it's also worth noting as well. Um, it's not just a two horse race. Man United are there or thereabouts as well, and they're currently five points behind us. Um, but it's worth saying that they won't be playing this weekend because they've got the League Cup final against Newcastle. Um, mm, this could be yeah. a real opportunity to put eight points between us and Man United to then level yeah. up our amount of games played. And also, if we do end up beating Everton on Wednesday, if we were to get two wins, we, we could possibly be 11 points ahead of Man United by the time the next time they play. So mm. it just shows you how quickly things can turn and how important it is that we actually yeah. do get the points on the board. Yeah, yeah, massively. It's crazy to... Th I can't believe they're five points behind us, you know. I, I find that absolutely baffling. I don't know how they've snuck up like that. But <laughs> how crucial does that last-minute Eddie and Ketty goal make that feel as well? Because if, if it weren't for mm. that, it would be it'd be so much closer. So, you know, it's it just goes to show these little fine margins have, have got us to this, this position. And um, I, mm. I've so often in recent years, it's been the other way around. Oh, if we'd only finished this and we'd only finished that, we'd be this place in the table. Now we're actually yeah. managing to do that in the majority of games and we're, we're sort of looking down at the table, which is a great position to be in, obviously. <laughs> um, is there anything else you want to add um, before we end the pod pod podcast today? <laughs> no, I, I can't think of anything. I, I just hope that the Arsenal boys do well. I hope we come out the blocks. I hope we perform. I hope we score a lot of goals and I... A clean sheet would be lovely as well. I think Ramsdale does tend to turn up against Leicester, doesn't he? He made some amazing saves the yeah. uh, last season, didn't he? I think the the most notably the one where um, we one we talked about earlier, but where Brendan Rodgers was just like, "I give up. Like, what, what can I do if we can't score?" So, mm -hmm. fingers crossed. We we play well. We put the pressure on Man City, and you know, hopefully they get beaten six nil against Bournemouth. Yep. Yep. So obviously, yeah, uh, three PM kickoff on Saturday for the Leicester game. Um, I think we're going to be recording on the Sunday this time, so it's not going to be instant match reaction. It'll be a little bit later the following day. Um, so please tune in then. Uh, but until next time, take care. Take care.